Hello Cinnamon Bun. Let's fix Fantastic Beasts. So reception to Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald was, how do you say this, less than stellar. Now story structure happens to be my superpower, so I am going to attempt to story fix Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald in this video and I'm gonna film the entire thing. So wish me luck everyone. Okay Cinnamon Bun, let's get this show on the road. So for this story fix I'm going to be using the same thing that I always use which is the plot embryo system. If you are new to that you can get a really quick primer by watching my now very ancient quick start plot embryo video um, and you can find that in the description. So all I have in front of me is uh, a couple of blank plot embryos, I have my brainstorming notebook which is just blank paper um, and I've got a couple of pens and pencils and I've got my cup of tea. So the first big decision that I had to make is around the fact that this film, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, is not a complete story. And it's not meant to be. It's designed to be part two of a five installment story. So a lot of this is set up and it doesn't have a proper ending because it's setting up things that are going to happen or were going to happen in the next three films. So I had to decide how to deal with that. Am I trying to make this movie into a standalone? Or am I trying to create a plot which would have then been broken into the five movies and kind of plot out what I would do as a story fix for the entire series? So the decision that I made was, since the first film had more of a defined ending and it worked a lot better as a standalone than this one did, um, I'm going to try and story fix the second film, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, into a complete story. So the story that I end up with, in theory, could be told over one movie or it could be fleshed out to be broken up into a series. Um, but the aim here is to tell a complete and satisfying story that has an ending. The second decision that I had to make is around the many plots of Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. So Crimes of Grindelwald is not just one story, but several stories woven together. A couple of subplots and what's meant to be a main plot. <laughs> Um, so Newt is kind of shoehorned in as a protagonist for the conflict that Grindelwald creates, but in a very clumsy way. So Dumbledore and Grindelwald, Grindelwald have the real protagonist-antagonist relationship here, and Dumbledore uses Newt as a proxy. Newt's own motivation has a lot more to do with his beasts and his books than it does stopping Grindelwald. So we have at least two plot embryos here. We have the story of how Dumbledore and the Wizarding World will stop the rise of magic Hitler, Grindelwald, which is essentially a prequel rehash of that good versus evil story of Harry versus Voldemort. Um, and then we have the story of Newt trying to write his book, Fantastic Beasts, which is the title of the movies. But this story and Newt's side of it is almost entirely absent from this movie, where it was a lot more prominent in the first one. So in theory I could do a plot embryo for each of these, however these videos already run really really long, even when I'm just creating one plot embryo and I don't want to spend the next two months of my life making this one video and I don't want it to be four hours long. So I have to pick one plot to focus on. So I did a poll on YouTube and on Twitter. Which version of the movie did you guys want to see? So Fantastic Beasts, the Pokemon movie or Dumbledore vs Racist Wizard 1.0? You guys voted for the Pokemon movie, so I'll be keeping Newt as a protagonist and the original story of Crimes of Grindelwald is probably going to have to change a whole lot to actually make that matter and to make Newt the actual protagonist. So the first thing that I'm going to do is brainstorm the central conflict of this story um, because if it is not necessarily um, taking down it's not necessarily you know just stopping Grindelwald in the same way that the main conflict of Harry Potter as a series was stopping Voldemort 
then we kind of have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what this story is actually about, um, if we want it to be a lot more focused on Newt and his beasts. I've started by brainstorming the central conflict. Um, I have Newt's possible motive goals on one side and motive goals for the antagonist on the other. I haven't actually chosen the antagonist yet. I don't know if it's still going to be Grindelwald, uh, sorry, Grindelwald, or if it's going to be someone else. This I think is going to be one of the hardest parts of this entire thing because once I get this one puzzle piece, like everything else should start to fit into place. But um, this kind of determines the direction of the entire story and I feel like everything that I'm doing here is taking it in a vastly different direction than the movie we actually got if I'm taking it totally away from Grindelwald and I still want to feel like I'm fixing that movie but at the same time I also want it to be good and I also want it to focus on Newt and the Beasts more. I brainstormed a few options here um, one of the ones that I'm most interested in is the idea of Newt having to save a particular group of Fantastic Beasts. So whether that is his own, <laughs> the ones that he has in captivity, um, or it might be uh, the magical creature kind of population of uh, the city, or it might be some kind of zoo, or it could be a particular species. There's lots of different ways you, we could go with that, and I think that could be a good starting point is saving a particular group of beasts and then that gives me like okay well why would they have to be saved um, and we've got different kind of options there maybe they're being hunted and exploited it might just be that they're being exterminated as pests um, and one of the ideas that I do quite like is that maybe there's a particular species of magical beast that is like kind of spreading uncontrollably or the population is growing and that threatens the Wizarding World because um, if you actually read the original Fantastic Beasts book which was released for comic relief it talks a lot about how basically the control of magical creatures in any given country is the responsibility of that country's magical government um, and it's very important because it is all about preventing muggles from finding out about the Wizarding World which is obviously a big important thing in the world of Harry Potter. Controlling magical creatures or a population of magical creatures is quite or is already quite high stakes in this world um, and so if we have a particular species um, which is maybe spreading uncontrollably which is breeding which is population is growing in a particular city and it's going to threaten exposure um, then you can see obviously how some kind of extermination might be attempted um, and what I kind of like the idea of is Newt trying to save these beasts because it might be, I'm not sure yet, it might be that they're actually really crucial to the ecosystem so you know they're seen as pests but they actually um, provide a really valuable um, part of the ecosystem wherever this is. I think it's going to be New York again for instance like bees and of course I would have to actually figure out what beasts they are. <laughs> so I actually found a copy of the original Fantastic Beasts book online um, and was kind of looking over that a bit last night in preparation for this. I actually really like the original Fantastic Beasts book, it's really fun. However, I don't necessarily want to read through the entire thing right now to try and find out which type of beast makes sense for this. Wouldn't it be handy if there was a particular type of Fantastic Beast which prevented the rise of fascist wizards? So. Part of the plot of the first movie was that Grindelwald, Grindelwald, oh my god, every single time I'm going to pronounce that wrong, um, was posing as Graves, who was, what's his name, Colin Farrell's character. I might be remembering this all wrong. Um, as far as I remember, he was the one that like set the beasts free from Newt's suitcase. And so they spent a lot of that movie trying to get them back. And part of that, my understanding was that that plan was by exposing the wizarding world to muggles um, that would like pave the way for 
wizards to take their rightful place um, as ruling over muggles because Grindelwald is a big old magical racist and he thinks that wizards should be in charge of muggles. What if we keep that? I don't know, maybe this won't work. What if Grindelwald or whoever else tried to set free basically every magical creature in the entire city? or in the entire world even. It would just be like the same kind of thing as the first one where all the magical creatures are free and we need to get them back under control, but on a bigger scale. And of course then it would make sense for Newt to be at the center of that as he is, you know, the world's most renowned magizoologist. Um, so it would make sense for him to be the protagonist and for him to take the lead um, on this like big scale kind of like recapturing and containing this situation of all the creatures being free. I feel like I'm finally getting somewhere. Yeah, we're finally getting some traction on the central conflict. Um, but I think my next magic question is going to be who is orchestrating this, if it is being orchestrated, and why? Um, like, what, what is someone's motivation for doing this? So, that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so we have our next magic question. Why would someone want to release or unleash all magical beasts on the world? So let's give it a brainstorm. So I've done a bit of brainstorming here and I've hit a little bit of a wall. So I think what I'm going to do, I mean there are, there is some stuff in here that I would maybe go with but there's nothing that's like jumping out at me as like yes this is the answer. So I think what I'm going to do is switch over to our actual plot embryo and start penciling in uh, what some of this might look like now that we've at least decided what the central conflict is even if I haven't decided exactly uh, who the antagonist is and how that's going to work. Okay, so I've penciled in a rough couple of, um, you know, broad strokes for plot points, given that we know that the magical creatures being unleashed, or a large number of them being unleashed, and the ensuing chaos is going to be the kind of central conflict um, of the story, which is the conflict zone, which is here. So that necessarily means that the comfort zone up here is that the magical creatures are under some kind of control and there is like order as opposed to chaos. I could go back to this and, you know, continue brainstorming on the antagonist and why they're doing this and the deeper kind of stakes and reasons for that. But what I've noticed here is that I still have no idea of the theme. I think if I figure out the theme, it will help give me some clues as to who the antagonist should be and what they should be after. With Grindelwald as the antagonist, and if we are going to keep his character largely the same, then it's going to be about um, it's going to be about the rise of fascism. It's going to be about racism. It's going to be there are other kind of paths. Um, one of the most straightforward um, or immediate things that comes to mind when you ask why would someone want to release or unleash all mag magical beasts on the world um, is a kind of environmental sort of animal rights sort of view. So um, they're being unleashed because they never deserved to be leashed in the first place. Um, so, you know, someone who is trying to free them um, because they think that they should be free, which I don't know. I feel like it, if you're going to make that your villain, yeah, there's some potential to, to really stick your foot in it ideologically there. So I think the best thing to do is to think about theme and then we can look at like what kinds of antagonists might come from that. actually hit on something that I do quite like here. When I'm brainstorming I try to just like splurge out everything that comes to mind and not 
uh, criticize it and not evaluate it and um, just get it out there on the page. Um, so the first one that I came up with was um, Newt believes that every magical creature can coexist with humans somehow versus some creatures are too dangerous to coexist with. Um, which this side would be the actual theme of the story, like what he's going to learn. And I really didn't like that at all um, because it's like, it feels like it's going in the opposite direction from uh, what these types of movies um, and these types of stories are meant to convey ideologically. Like it feels like it's going from, you know, a more compassionate um, kind of view to something a lot, actually a lot more cynical and maybe a lot more violent. And then I had, he will never be able to get along with the, with people the way he does with creatures. Um, and then realizing that he does have things in common with other people and can work with them too. Um, I did quite like this one. Um, so like the idea of the conflict being not really about dealing with the creatures, but having to cooperate with other people that is actually the big um, kind of hurdle for him. But then I felt that then that would be kind of changing the conflict zone because the conflict zone wouldn't be just that the magical creatures had been unleashed. For Newt specifically, it would be having to work with other people to um, recapture the creatures. And then I had a kind of flip side to this first one, um, which is that Newt starts out believing that some creatures are too dangerous to capture compassionately or maybe to capture at all. Um, versus realising that there's always a way. Um, then I had that he can't handle chaos, he can only thrive in order, uh, versus he can adapt to chaos. And finally I had Newt starting out thinking that he's the only one who can deal with creatures in the way that he can, like he has to do it all himself, versus realising that he can actually trust and teach other people and sometimes he has to, um, like he can't do it all by himself. Now I think I really like this last one the most, and I think on doing this, it's kind of showing me why Newt feels so kind of superfluous to the Crimes of Grindelwald. Um, he does have an arc, um, so he starts out, you know, refusing to take a side on this um, world versus Grindelwald uh, conflict. And by the end, he, he takes a side and he realises that he has to fight him. Um, but to me, that is like, it's a tiny, tiny part of that entire movie. Um, and I don't personally think that it's done in a particularly compelling way. Um, obviously, as we've discussed, this is part two of you know a five, what was meant to be a five instalment series. So I can't say what Newt's arc might have been or was meant to be over the rest of the series. This is just me trying to figure out what I would like to do with his character. But I think that's part of why he feels so superfluous as an apparent protagonist is that his arc and a change for him and his character isn't really a central focus um, of the story at all. So I think I'm going to go with this as my theme um, and let's plug that in and see how it changes things. So um, I haven't like worried too much about the phrasing and stuff here um, I've just gone straight in um, to write them in here instead of like workshopping this one particular theme. In his kind of ignorance uh, state, he he's the only one who can deal with creatures. He has to do it all himself. Um, and then in his enlightenment state, so this is the kind of theme that he's going to realise, he can teach others and sometimes he has to trust others and accept their help. So what I really like about this as a theme is that it actually relates to the idea of the Fantastic Beasts book. Someone who thinks he's the only one who can do what he does um, isn't really going to try and teach anyone else. Um, or at least that's one way in which someone might act um, if they believe this. Learning to trust others and learning to teach others his knowledge instead of just trying to do everything himself is a really good reason for him to actually write his book. So this sets it up I think quite well to maybe have the end of the story at change be him deciding to write his book and um, share his knowledge with the world um, versus keeping it all to himself and you know trying to deal with everything to do with magical creatures himself. Now that I've got this theme I can either start filling out some more of this um, and extrapolating other things based on that um, and seeing how the rest of the plot starts to take shape around that. Or, now knowing this, I could go back to the drawing board on 
the antagonist and you know the reason that the beasts get unleashed in the first place. Which one do I want to do? Because in this version of the story if the focus really is on Newt and his arc and you know the the magical creature chaos then it doesn't really matter as much why the beasts are unleashed in the first place. Um, obviously we need to have some reason that they are and it needs to hold up but it doesn't need to be this huge elaborate like scheme of Grindelwald's because he isn't really the focus here. I think I'm going to do some more work on this and filling in some more things here based on this theme and then we'll come back to that antagonist question. happy with how this is coming together. Um, I have like a really vague kind of arc for the entire plot now. Um, it's really vague in that like you know down at plot point five I've got things like Newt realises he can't do this alone and comes up, up with a plan to coordinate with the ministry and he knows he has to let go of controlling everything and let others help um, and then Newt swallows his pride and teaches the ministry people how to handle it and they enact the plan. So obviously I'm like, he comes up with a plan, but I have no idea what that plan is. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of specifics missing here, but I think this is a pretty strong arc or like direction for the plot to go, um, even if it is really quite vague and amorphous now. Um, I think I'm going to do another brainstorm on the whole antagonist question, like the why are the beasts unleashed in the first place question um, and then hopefully from there I can start um, actually digging in and making this more specific. leaning towards just using Grindelwald um, and having him unleash all the creatures and then I was like you know maybe he's doing that to expose the world and create all this havoc and stuff but we just skip all of the blood packed like epic Grindelwald versus Dumbledore stuff and Dumbledore like defeats Grindelwald you know fairly early on and he gets like arrested or whatever um, and let's say that you know, this is like a subplot, I guess. So, but that still leaves all of the the creature chaos to be dealt with, which is still kind of wreaking havoc on the world. I feel like that makes sense, but I'm also a bit worried that it's just going to feel like it should really be about Grindelwald then, if he is the antagonist. <sighs> okay, so my other kind of thread, which I feel like might fit with this is if it's actually a magical creature or a magical being that is responsible for unleashing all the beasts. Maybe a, kind of a creature that has been harmed or abused at the hands of humans which already has animosity towards humans and um, thinking about like centaurs. So I'm quite tired and I feel like this isn't coming as easily as I would like so I think what I'm going to do is take a bit of a break um, get some food. So, back in a little bit. Okay, um, so I've just had a little break. I did some reading about some magical creatures. I had a little think about it and I also just um, watched a YouTube video to do something else for a little bit. I think, what well, I was gonna start with just how might all the magical creatures be unleashed? But I think what I'm going to start with is actually how they are contained in the first place. Um, because there's an entire section on this in the original Fantastic Beasts book called Magical Beasts in Hiding.
So let's think about um, the ways that these constraints, I suppose, could be broken um, to create the kind of uh, magical uh, creature chaos that we're talking about doing for this story. Really the most straightforward uh, path for doing that is to look at habitats. So habitats and reservations, the, the places where creatures are physically contained um, and breaking those uh, containment measures to let them out. If we are looking at a series of safe habitats and reservations like across the world, then somehow all of them being unleashed at the same time is it has to be some kind of grand plan or it would take a lot of explaining to figure out why that would happen all at the same time. Um, one idea that I do kind of like is to create a big habitat which we can then have unleashed to keep the scope of the story I guess a little bit smaller. So I had thought about just setting this story in New York um, in the same way that the first one was. Most of the actual Crimes of Grindelwald is set in Paris but I don't see any particular reason to actually keep that. <laughs> in the same way that there are these kind of like magical hotspots or like secret areas of um, the Muggle world um, so Diagon Alley, Hogwarts, um, even the Ministry for Magic, these like like wizard areas which are only accessible through magic. Um, maybe we have a really big magical creature kind of version of that in New York, maybe in Central Park actually, I think that would be cool. Um, so what if there was like this big secret, maybe it's some kind of reserve, maybe it's where like a lot of like magizoology research is done and things, um, in which case there's a perfect reason for Newt to go there, um, if he doesn't already work there already. Maybe to start with, that is um, where the breach is, you know, like everything from that is unleashed um, across New York. Now let's do a little bit of brainstorming on why this would happen. This stuff forever because it requires like a fair amount of world building which is like getting into the trenches and getting into the weeds like a lot more than I would like to for like this bird's eye view of the plot which is the plot embryo. What I'm coming back to is actually what if the unleashing is like this big mystery over the course of the story like um, the ministry or the magical congress have all these suspects of people they think might be responsible, so people like Grindelwald. But, and so there's this kind of mystery element, but maybe in the end, it turns out not to be some grand plan after all. It might actually just be a total accident. Um, one of the creatures that I really love from Fantastic Beasts are Jarvies, um, which are basically overgrown ferrets that can talk and they mostly speak in short sentences kind of constantly. And I think they swear a lot. Um, or they're basically just like really rude big ferrets <laughs> um, and I just love the idea of it all just turning out to be like a Jarvie got loose and just caused this mayhem somehow almost like like a like a comedy like um, I'm thinking about like old kind of comedies like Mousetrap and oh what's the one I'm thinking of a lot of the plots in the Adams family kind of work like that, where it's not like, I mean, there are often villains and stuff, but like a lot of it is just like these crazy coincidences, like these elaborate chains of actions and consequences, which end up having these kind of crazy results. I kind of like the idea of it all just being something like that and just kind of eliminating Grindelwald altogether. 
So I've just written in here at plot point two, Newt goes to visit the Central Park Reservation for the first time, and due to a series of unfortunate coincidences beginning with a loose jarvey, all the creatures are released into New York. And obviously, what exactly the series of unfortunate coincidences is, um, is an entire brainstorm in and of itself, but I don't think that I need to get into that quite yet. Maybe even to complete this entire plot embryo, that I think for me would be like the next phase of brainstorming once this plot embryo is complete um, and we're, we were going to, you know, uh, turn it into like a script or something. Especially because those that set of coincidences is going to rely heavily on like the world building of how that Central Park reservation works, which I've just created the idea of that and I've not you know, done any world building for it. So yeah, I think we'll leave that on hold for the moment and move on. As you can see from uh, how heavy the shadows are now, it's starting to get dark. Um, it is, what time is it? It's half three. Well, it's really dark for half three, but it is the middle of winter in Scotland. I think I'm actually going to leave it there for today. Yeah, pick this up tomorrow. Um, having slept on it I think will help a lot um, in terms of getting this uh, finalised and stuff and we'll pick up with this tomorrow with a fresh brain and uh, hopefully some proper daylight again. Okay, see you then. Okay friends, we are back. It is the next day and we're going to dive back into this. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is just take a look at this and in pencil see if there's anything else that I can kind of extrapolate, anything else that has come to me or that will come to me um, now that I've slept on this for a little bit because I often find that does help. Okay, so having had a quick look at this, I think that I am going to focus on plot point one and I would like to establish um, Newt's backstory. So, which isn't really something that is dealt with in the movie at all that I can think of, or in the movies even. So I want to figure out what in his past led him to believe this. Like, where did this belief come from? expected that to be a little bit more difficult than it was but I think I've actually got something that I really like for this. Um, this is not as far as I know um, part of the canon for the movies of Fantastic Beasts but um, there's a little bio of Newt um, in the original Fantastic Beasts book that I looked at and one of the things it mentions is that his mum bred fancy hippogriffs <laughs> so um, I took that little tiny piece of canon uh, backstory, I mean I guess it's one particular kind of canon, I don't know if it actually is for the movies, and tried to come up with an experience which would explain how Newt comes to believe this. And so what I've come up with, I think I quite like it, um, I think there's some kind of hippogriff like accident. Um, I don't want to make him an orphan because that's just like so Harry Potter that I can't handle it. So I think maybe Either they were like both riding the hippogriff and like flying or they were just like tending to it or something. Um, but there's this one particular hippogriff which has like a really specific like fear. Like they all have their own quirks and stuff. And I think they work kind of like horses in that they can get like spooked really easily. Obviously it's dangerous um, because just like horses they're big creatures and especially if you're on top of one they can hurt you. This hippogriff gets spooked and I think maybe they're riding it. I think maybe they're flying. And the mum, who, you know, is very experienced with hippogriffs and um, who Newt kind of looks up to as kind of being, I guess, like kind of all knowing when it comes to dealing with beasts. She's very experienced. The mum tries what they would normally use, I guess, some kind of like calming spell on the hippogriff that spooked. But because 
the hippogriff is afraid of this one particular thing. I don't know what it is. It'll be something totally innocuous, like a particular kind of flower or trees or a bird or something. I guess if they're flying, then a particular kind of bird might make sense. Yeah, because the hippogriff can still see this one particular like phobia it has, the calming spell isn't working uh, that his mum is trying. And Newt knows that it has this specific fear. Like he knows the hippogriffs really well. Either the mum like... She doesn't know that it has this specific fear, so she doesn't know this particular hippogriff as well as she maybe does the other ones, or maybe she's just so panicked, or maybe she's in pain because they're in an accident. Um, and so she just doesn't think to do what Newt does, which is to vanish the item, the thing in question, um, which is spooking the hippogriff. Um, either vanish it or, like, I don't know, cast a disillusionment charm on it or... Like anything that's just going to like remove it from the hippogriff's sight so that the calming spell can do its work and the hippogriff can calm down. And I think in that instance, maybe he actually saves both of their lives by doing that. But it's not as simple as that. I think his mum still gets hurt somehow. Maybe she breaks a bone, maybe she falls from a height um, and he has to... I think he's got a dad as well. So um, he has to go and get his dad and it's like this kind of like traumatic experience for him seeing his mum injured and vulnerable in this in this particular context in which he has previously seen her as invincible i suppose i think that is the part that is so scary for him is that you know he understands that a lot of other people or most people don't know how to handle fantastic beasts um the way he and his family do or the way he and his mum do but he maybe sees his mum as infallible up until that point and then after this point it seems like he was the only thing uh, that could have saved the day that could have saved them in that instance um and even his mum doesn't always know how to um how to handle a situation with a fantastic beast or a magical creature um, and how to keep herself safe. Of course, that doesn't mean that actually Newt is the only person in the world who can adequately handle fantastic beasts or magical creatures um, and that his mum wasn't actually experienced after all. Freak accidents and difficult situations happen. It might have been the case that she would have also realized what she needed to do to vanish that particular object or whatever it was to calm the horse uh, sorry the, the hippogriff <laughs> and that newt just thought of it before her but you can see how as a child this really like big scary experience could solidify that idea in newt's head um like it's not a rational thought necessarily but you can see how it was formed that he is the only one that can actually deal with this really these really dangerous magical creature situations and even people who seem um competent or experienced can't really be trusted to keep themselves safe and to keep other people safe i think i really like that actually as some backstory um let's add that into plot point one for his backstory so and what i had here already was just some like kind of comfort zone status quo like where is newt at the beginning of this story what's his life kind of like which i think still works perfectly with this backstory that i've come up with and um, i just need a little more space to write it in so i'll probably just rewrite that stuff um in a shorter form so i've just written newt saves himself and his mother in a hippogriff accident as a child breaking his trust in other people to safely handle beasts um, and then for the present day, I have just that he's an overworked freelance beast wrangler. Um, so my idea with this was to have him working by himself because, again, he feels like he's the only person that can do this um, the way that he can do it. So maybe he's actually even had offers of work from the Ministry of Magic or, you know, governments of magic um, to join something, you know, areas like the Department of Reg for Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. Maybe he's been offered jobs like that before, or maybe just, you know, everyone in his life is like, why aren't you joining something like that? It seems like you could do a lot of good there. Um, but he's just not willing to work with other people on this because he just doesn't feel like anyone else can do it the same as well as he can. Um, which I guess is like kind a, a pretty like arrogant way to think, but I feel like there is a way to do that where it's not, he doesn't need to be an asshole to think that. He just needs, he's almost just kind of like a martyr, I guess. Um, and of course, like his experience as a child does support this idea. Um, I just think that 
he is going to always refuse working with other people or accepting help um, or accepting resources and things because again he has this deep down idea that he has to do everything himself. Where do I want to go next? Either plot point five or plot point four. Okay, I guess we do need to clarify what the problem is before we can figure out how he solves it. So let's do plot point four. So these are actually two magic questions, um, which I don't usually recommend like brainstorming more than one at once, but I am not gonna take my own advice. So deal with it. I think actually I'm also going to get, I'm just gonna pull up um, the Fantastic Beast book on my laptop here so that I can refer to it and because let's get into some details with some Fantastic Beasts because that's meant to be like all the fun of this story in the first place. I think I've got an idea in mind as well of what I would like the big creature to deal with to be. Is there an index in this? Cool, okay we've got a list, good stuff. she might have done it. Yeah, once I brainstormed this plot point, it all kind of started to fall into place. Um, I'm just gonna write this up and then we can get into the final version. Okay, this is definitely not a crucial detail, but um, I would really like to come up with a fun kind of Harry Potter-ish name for the Central Park Reservation. So I think I'm going to do that now. Okay, I really like how unnecessarily long and wordy this one is. Um, it's got that like real bureaucracy plus magic kind of vibe that I associate with Harry Potter. So the Central Park Reservation for the Conservation and Research of Magical Creatures. So that's going to be the full name, but I think we're probably just going to end up referring to it as the Central Park Reservation anyway. But that's just a fun little detail that it's nice to have. Before I present you with the final version of the story that I came up with, I want to take a quick minute to tell you about the Story Magic Academy. So everything that you just saw me do, every skill, every technique, every magic question, every brainstorm, all of that is part of my complete plot embryo system for creating stories. And you can learn that entire system step by step in the Story Magic Academy. If you want to be able to do what I just did in this video, in a matter of hours or days, if you want to be able to fix any story you like or create any story you want, the Academy will teach you how to do that. It does take guts of some kind to do videos like this, to say on camera, I'm going to fix this story that costs millions and millions of dollars to make 
and I'm gonna do it better than fucking JK Rowling. <laughs> that can be kind of scary and the only thing that actually gives me the courage to make videos like this and to take on challenges like this is that I know my system. I know it works, I know it like the back of my hand, my, I have my entire heart's trust in it. What is that sentence? My heart's trust in it. My what? entire heart's trust in it. All of the trust in my heart is in the plot. So I'm telling you this because the Story Magic Academy is open for enrolment right now and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it at the end of this video but for now let's get into my final story fixed version of Fantastic Beasts. Plot point one. Newt saves himself and his mother in a hippogriff accident as a child, breaking his trust in other people's ability to safely handle beasts. In the present he's an overworked freelance beast wrangler. He thinks that beast infrastructure is inadequate, but he won't work with anyone. And then at plot point two, Newt is visiting the Central Park Reservation for the research and conservation of magical creatures, when, due to some incompetence and a series of unfortunate coincidences beginning with a loose jarvey, the entire creature population is unleashed on New York. Beasts run free, causing chaos, hurting both muggles and wizards, and threatening to expose the magical world. Obliviator teams are overstretched, things are getting through to the news, everyone is panicked. Newt clashes with the government and reservation teams trying to contain it. He apparates all over the city, recapturing beasts. People die when he wastes time on low threat creatures, and they can't find the Nudu. He burns himself out until he can't apparate anymore and barely has energy for basic spells. At plot point five, now essentially powerless and things are only getting worse, Newt realises he has to get help. He magically copies his beast's journal, sending it out to the wizard citizens of New York so that they can deal with the low threat creatures while he and the professionals go after the Nudu. At plot point six, Newt orchestrates a plan to capture the Nudu swallows his pride and apologises to the teams so that they'll work with him. He has to take a big risk and trust them. It all starts to go wrong, but one person's keen observation of the Nudu saves the plan. It's what Newt would do. He's not the only one who can. They safely capture the Nudu, having now discovered new information about it. At plot point seven, New York successfully recaptures the creatures and contains the situation. And finally at plot point eight, Newt joins the Department for Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. He helps improve the security and living conditions in the Central Park Reservation. He also starts writing Fantastic Beasts, the book, to share his expertise more widely. And as our last shot, we see the mischievous Jarvie which started it all is still loose and living the high life. So there you go. That is my story fixed version of Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Um, let me know what you think of it in the comments, please, because did I fix it? Did I not? Please tell me. So my version is very, very different from the actual movie that got made um, because I removed Grindelwald basically from it altogether um, and you guys voted to do the Pokemon movie version of this and I feel like I was true to that, but it does change the story very drastically. So I'm not using a lot of the source material, which is fine, I guess. Um, I still feel like it's a more solid and satisfying story. Um, obviously it's a complete story rather than just like installment two of five. It's a lot lighter in tone, I guess, um, whereas Grindelwald is going for this like big, heavy, self-serious, good versus evil again, even though we just did that in Harry Potter. I kind of um, went for a lighter, more comedic, fun and kind of wacky version. Um, so I hope that you appreciate that. So, as I said, enrolment for the Story Magic Academy is open right now for a limited time. Writing stories is really time consuming. <laughs> I know this from experience. So if you're not sure about joining the Story Magic Academy, I just want you to think about what kinds of stories or projects could you do or say yes to if you knew the steps to always be able to come up with a really solid story. You knew how to always get a really powerful theme, like a compelling protagonist and a satisfying ending. If you had this toolbox of story creation techniques that you knew you could always rely on, that you knew with a bit of time and effort would always get you to a story that you were happy with, what kinds of stories would you write? What kinds of stories would you pitch? 
Personally, I think the Story Magic Academy is the best course ever, but obviously I'm a little biased. So here is what some students have to say about it. If you feel really overwhelmed, that's exactly where I was. This is the perfect course. Like, especially if you don't feel like you know how to outline things or um, order them according to like, I don't know, broad things to details, like how to do that. Um, or if you just feel like you're stuck and don't have any ideas of like another story you want to write um, and you want to figure out how to like come up with ideas or you want to learn how to problem solve better, any of those reasons, you should sign up and take this course. <laughs> Cause it was like the best like money spent ever. I'm so happy I did this. It changed my entire writing career. Like I would not be where I am today or have the amount of confidence I have without the course. So I like can't recommend it enough. I've told so many people about this course already. <laughs> so here's a little taster of what the Story Magic Academy covers. So at the start of the course, I will teach you the steps to creating really great story seeds that you're really excited about without you having to rely on these like rare strikes of inspiration or even using dreams, which is something that a lot of us writers do, to get that like first stroke of inspiration, that first idea for a new story. And over the course, I'll take you through the steps of creating a really solid concrete theme, a really powerful central conflict, and a compelling protagonist. And I'll show you how to bring all of these threads together into perfect story harmony in a complete and satisfying plot embryo. And along the way, it will also teach you how to solve any story problem or plot hole that you come up against because problems always come up, no matter how experienced you are, but they don't have to stop you in your tracks. You'll also learn how to master time and pacing in the plot embryo, how to create amazing tragic plots and plots for antagonists and villains, and finally, how to weave together multiple plots and subplots to create one unified story solar system. So if you're ready to supercharge your storytelling and master the entire plot embryo system once and for all, I'll see you there. So enrolment for the Story Magic Academy is open now for a limited time and you can take a look at all the details, all the information and enroll yourself at academy.rachelstephen.com. And if you stick around, I'm actually doing a live stream immediately after this video finishes premiering. So I'll be chatting about the Story Magic Academy and answering any questions that you might have about it. So once this video is over, find the link in the description to the Q&A live stream and make yourself a cup of something good and let's have a chat. Now if you're watching this sometime in the future and you've missed the Q&A, don't worry, you can still find all the information on the enrollment page and if there's anything there that you still can't find an answer to, then you can shoot me an email at rachel at rachelsteven.com and I will get back to you as soon as I can. So I only open up the doors for the Story Magic Academy twice a year and enrollment for this semester is closing in a few days. So if you're interested, don't waste any time. That's it from me, Cinnamon Bun. I'll talk to you soon. Like, I've tried, I'm like, do you want to go this way? And it's like, no. And I'm like, do you want to go the other way then? And it's like, no. And I'm like, girl, don't you fucking dare. This is my life. No, this. Let me know in the comments if I'm saying Grindelwald wrong. How long is this gonna last? It takes butts. It does take it butts. It does take butts. Most things take butts. I think it is Vald because he's meant to be German. Right. What's according to your Rachel? I made it. Now you want what me else? to convince people that it's good? What the fuck? <laughs> it's good, just believe me. <laughs> Question, all of that is all of that. Art. All of that. <laughs> God damn. Look, it's harder to speak than you would think when there is a camera on you. It helps. Loosen up though. Yeah. So the listening you see, just chuck your coffee all over them. <laughs> like some people. Look, I sneezed. <laughs> and I could get the coffee cup out of my hand and bring it up. <laughs> yeah, just chuck it over there. I know. Okay, oh my god, seriously. <laughs> you just That leaf is so centered.